Scott Falver from McKinnis Wilson Lawyers. Uh, Scott has done work cover work for over 20 years. So he's done a lot, he's one of our current panel providers. Um, he's done a lot of alignment within the health and community care industry. And he's seen a lot of the good stories and also a lot of the bad stories. So I thought what we try and do here is, now that we've got our workplace injury lawyer, Mia, has filled the role, we'll show the other side of how you can actually minimise your risk of common law, but also see if you can balance that competing duty of care that you're all delicately balancing each day, looking after children and looking after your staff. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Matt. It's really embarrassing. I'm wearing the same tie today <laughs> as uh, the... I do have other ties. <laughs> that is so embarrassing. Uh, um, thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you today. I'm hoping to touch on some of the legal aspects that arise out of the interaction between workplace health and safety issues and, and compensation issues. And what I thought that I would do is I just sensitise us, set some flags for us to swim between in terms of exactly what are these key legal issues in, in relation to workplace health and safety and compensation. Focusing on the two key areas of claim, statutory claims for workers' compensation and common law claims for damages. What are they and how do they interact with each other? Just a splash of what that is about to set a backdrop against which we will talk about some hopefully some practical uh, ideas and strategies relevant to claim management and claim minimisation. Some compass points, if you like. I suspect that some of you have had uh, direct contact with the statutory claim process, and perhaps not everyone has engaged in the common law claim process. So if I may, I'll just quickly remind you of exactly how that uh, how our compensation regime in Queensland works in relation to those two types of claim. Now essentially a statutory claim for workers' compensation, as you know, that responds to an injured worker who's injured at work in the course of their employment. That person will be entitled to workers' compensation to the, for, for the period of time that a doctor certifies them as suffering from a work-related injury. Critically, for our purposes in our discussion today, that is a no-fault scheme. So as long as there is that medical connection between injury um, and, 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 uh, and work, then workers' compensation is paid. And as you know, that's generally base wages and medical expenses. So that's a statutory claim for compensation. You're up and down, every day, compo claim. A lot of the work that I do with work cover and with employers in this sector is when a claim converts from or becomes a common law claim for damages. Now these are, generally speaking, far more significant claims. They're significant claims in terms of the damages that are sought, the compensation that's being pursued, the compensation that can become payable in the event that a claim is successful. And there are costs that are associated with that, consequential adverse premium impact, but also an enormous cost to your workforce, to the injured worker involved, and to your organisation in terms of just dealing with and engaging with the common law claim process. Now, a common law claim is different from a statutory claim in one key area. This is a fault-based scheme. An injured worker can only proceed and succeed with a common law claim if they can establish that the employer has done something wrong. The employer is at fault. The employer has breached the duty of care that is owed to the worker in the context of that workplace setting. Now, you may ask, well, why does someone pursue a common law claim? What are the triggers to see someone go from a statutory claim to a common law claim? Now, obviously, there are financial factors. Those financial factors generally re revolve around notions and concepts of economic loss. And importantly, in those circumstances where an injured worker considers that they've suffered an injury that's going to have an impact on their capacity to earn income into the future, future economic loss, that is generally the most significant motivator or the, the, the uh, most significant aspect of a claim that is to be pursued. And if someone is successful with that claim and a judge makes an award of damages, it's normally this concept of future economic loss that is the highest award of damages. Now just 
So drilling down for our purposes today as to exactly what's that mean when an employer is liable? Well, what the law ex expects of an employer in terms of discharging duties of care that are owed to their workers, the law expects that foreseeable risks of injury will be identified, assessed and responded to. A failure to do that that results in injury will generally sound in a finding of liability. So the sorts of concepts that become relevant when I'm providing advices to you or to your insurer in this space of potential common law liability is what have we done to identify, assess and respond to those risks. And all of the speakers today in different ways have touched on the sort of concepts that come together for consideration by a court in looking at this issue. Critical notions like training and instruction and direction become very important. But a lot of that sometimes gets lost when these sorts of issues are three years down the track, cold hard light of a courtroom, what was it, the subject of instruction and training three years ago is all of a sudden analysed and exposed and dissected in a courtroom in terms of whether or not it was adequate or not. And sometimes, especially when I'm advising in these circumstances or addressing a court in relation to these circumstances, some of the key things that uh, sometimes get lost in terms of the forum where these issues um, end up re revolve around keeping a record of instruction and direction that's given and also being able to show that there's been some level of reinforcement, understanding and competency-based assessment that someone understands that instruction and direction. Now if I could just pick that apart for you a little bit. I have been involved in a case recently where, in my view, the employer had an excellent system with respect to uh, its approach to manual handling and identifying, assessing and responding to what those risks were. It was very good, it was sophisticated, it involved a whole matrix, a suite of measures, there, were, there was workbooks uh, that reflected a certain level of instruction and training, um, there were videos that were shown, um, and it was, it was really, uh, really uh, uh, comprehensive uh, response to the risks of manual handling. And it involved a cleaning system and the trolleys that the cleaners then used, there were little flip cards that were on the trolleys to remind the workers of some of the critical tasks that had been identified as giving rise to a high risk of, of, of injury um, from manual handling. This injured worker suffered an injury, there was a statutory claim for compensation and ultimately converted to a common law claim where I became involved. And the employer's instructions were very clear that they had this comprehensive manual handling regime and it was, uh, everybody had told them how good it was and it was so comprehensive. Well, it, and it was, there's no doubt about that. But this particular worker, English was not her first language. And throughout, she participated in the whole training regime and um, displayed a level of understanding and interaction with the facilitators and the trainers such that they thought that she uh, understood and comprehended the instruction that had been given but she hadn't understood at all in terms of certainly not sufficiently for a court to be satisfied that there was a level of understanding or comprehension or a, or a level of competency there for the employer to be found to have discharged the duty of care. So small things like that need to be taken into consideration in terms of developing regimes and responses to the sort of risks that will be, uh, that will be encountered. We have similar problems, particularly uh, uh, in, in, in these areas with respect to um, there being documentation to show that there has been a, an accurate record of not only the instruction that's been provided in terms of, say, induction, but when we have a regime, to that, a training regime, which extends to a level of reinforcement or refresher training, that we have records to show that that refresher training actually takes place. And again, we can have quite sophisticated training regimes, but if we don't follow our own practices with respect to follow up and renewal uh, with respect to some of these key risk areas, then a court, when considering whether the employer has discharged the duty, could become quite critical of whether or not that has actually occurred. You see, underpinning all of this 
is the law considers that that relationship between employer and worker is special. It's different. It's in the category of teacher and student, doctor and patient. And as a result of that, the law expects uh, employers to do more to ensure that they've discharged their duty. Because the law takes the view that it's the employer that has the capacity to control the work system and has the capacity to ensure that workers are provided with and get access to the instruction and training that they might need in order to discharge their duties. So training is a very big, big, uh, a big part of ensuring that you can discharge or show that you've discharged the duty of care that's owed. It's important to remember exactly what the law expects of employers in this area. Now, it's not to do that which is ideal. It's not to eliminate risk. It's not even to do that which is optimal. In order to discharge the duty of care that is owed to employers, we must just do that which is reasonable. And what is reasonable in a given situation normally involves an assessment of the gravity of the risk. The higher the risk of injury, then the law will expect a greater response from an employer in being able to show that that risk of injury has been properly responded to and duty discharged. So to go to Kylie's example, the risks associated with um, some of those issues with respect to clutter and so on, a reasonable response might be a direction that um, stuff is put away and that there, isn't those, there aren't those tripping hazards and so on. Um, and that may be considered an appropriate direction. And if a worker failed to do that, um, and as a result of that failure they suffered an injury, well there may be circumstances there where the employer is considered to have discharged the duty of care. And although it's very unfortunate that an injury has occurred, it has to happen in circumstances where the employer is negligent. But of course the higher a risk, for example, um, a ladder that uh, wasn't secured, um, th that may present a more significant risk, so the law might expect there to be a more sophisticated response to uh, that sort of a risk. And you'll see there in, in your pack some of the work that Goodstart did in respond, giving that, responding to that sort of a risk is that those ladders are actually taken off site. So in order to respond to that risk, the steps that have been taken have involved actually removing the risk from the workplace. So those sorts of risks, um, the sort of risks that you're exposed to will impact, workers are exposed to, um, may require a different sort of response in order to discharge the duty. Now in this area, concepts of contributory negligence sometimes come up. You know, we often hear the term, yeah, but don't workers have a duty of care themselves not to, not to hurt themselves? And that's true, they do. But the concept of contributory negligence at law, what that means is that someone must do something that is more than just momentary inattention or inadvertence. The law says that in order to discharge the duty of care, and for a worker's conduct to be found to be truly contributory to an injury, then it must be more than momentary inattention or inadvertence. If it is established, then the way the law deals with that is the law will reduce, or a court will reduce an award of damages to reflect the contributory negligence. And that's normally expressed in percentage terms. But it's important to realise that um, for, for it to be truly contributory negligence, it needs to be much more than momentary inattention or inadvertence. The law says that a proper work system, properly responding to risks of injury, should deal with things like workers, familiarity with a work system, and, and, and those sorts of concepts in order to properly discharge the duty of care. In terms of some of the strategies that I share with employers in, in terms of dealing with some of these challenges and looking to discharge a duty of care, one of the greatest things that we can do and have available to us these days is to properly utilise the technology that's available. You see, with these sorts of claims, there's a three-year limitation period. So someone can be injured tomorrow, and generally speaking, they will have three years before they can bring a common law claim for damages. And of course that passage of time raises all sorts of forensical challenges with respect to evidence a gathering, witness recollection, all of those sorts of things. 
the gold standard with respect to so many accidents and injury scenes and investigation is to capture that incident scene by, on the, in, by way of a photograph. 20 years ago, to take a photograph of an incident, you know, it involved big cameras and it was, you know, quite, quite an ordeal. Then we sort of moved on to digital cameras and it became a little bit easier. But now, we've almost got a camera with us all the time. To be able to take a photo of that incident scene, that area, at the time of the injury, can become really important when it comes to the sort of work that I then might have to do uh, in advising you or your insurer about exactly what uh, aspects of the work system um, may create some issues or may be in issue with respect to a potential claim. So photographs of incident scenes can be critical because obviously three years later um, there can be all sorts of challenges as to exactly what occurred and when and, and so on. The other thing that I really encourage employers to do is that in the event that you have procedures developed, and it's, it's a great idea to do it if, if you don't have them, but to have procedures with respect to incident investigation and to follow them. So, and, and it shouldn't be something that becomes a secret that's only shared between the line, investiga line manager that might be doing the investigation or the area manager and executive management. It's something that should be shared with the workforce. So that the workforce know that in circumstances where there is a workplace injury, there will be a procedure that's followed and an investigation will involve a meeting with the injured worker to discuss the circumstances of the event. It will involve interaction with people who have been identified as witnesses with respect to the event, to explore with the witness as to exactly what they saw, what they were told and so on. Um, and that all of this occurs in an environment where that information that is then collated in that way is then shared directly with the worker. There's a whole heap of different ways that that can occur. The simplest way is that if a statement is taken, you read back and the essential parts of it, but then invite the worker to take it away, consider it overnight to make sure that we've captured the information correct, and then invite the worker to sign, date and return it. They keep a copy as well. So that there's this collaborative approach to trying to get to uh, the bottom of exactly what has occurred. So that, that sort of level of interaction can be really important. Another thing that can be really important in terms of uh, a, a sophisticated incident investigation system and how that consequently feeds into ultimate risk management and claim management is what I call the exit survey. Most people, in the event that somebody exits from a workplace, there'll be an exit survey of some type. What I encourage uh, employers to think about is at that exit survey point, the question is asked, have you been involved in any incident or injury during your period of employment with us? And in the event that a worker says, well, yes, there's an opportunity at that point to then explore with, that, with the worker what occurred, when, and in what circumstances. Now, that may create some problems that they're about to leave in terms of actually getting the full depth of what occurred, but it gives you the opportunity at that point to at least make some inquiries such that if something was to happen three years later, you had some capacity or opportunity to explore with the workplace exactly what occurred. That's something that, that I encourage workers to, uh, employers to think about. Another key a key aspect of incident investigation and consequential risk management in this area is the way that you frame and design your incident reporting systems, your forms. Human nature is such that if a question is asked in a form, then human nature is such that it's normally answered. Now, sometimes there are quite um, artificial, in my view, and potentially distorting questions that are asked as part of the incident reporting regime. A key one sometimes being, what can be done to prevent this injury occurring again? Now in some contexts, some circumstances, that's a very valid question. But if the truth of the matter is that because of the training systems that were in place, because of the work procedures that were in place, the truthful answer is, well look, we don't think that there's uh, anything further that could be done other than to apply training, uh, job safety analysis, JSA 1, 2, 3 with respect to manual handling. Now if that's the case, then that's what should be put in. Sometimes I see employers, or particularly their investigators, they feel obliged to perhaps come up with something more sophisticated or comprehensive than that. Now if that's just truly unnecessary, 
then that is all that needs to be said in the incident report itself. Because again, three years later, that incident report might be being scrutinised and in the event that the investigator has made some suggestions or observations with respect to alternatives that could be made to the particular risk that's the subject of the investigation, three years later in the context of a courtroom, that could lose all context completely in terms of the observation that was shared as part of that investigation process. Now, that's really a question of conditioning and training, how people go about investigating matters. Um, but it can be um, a very sensible strategy, in my view, about managing some of the risks that might come out of the way that investigative process is, is, is un, uh, um, uh, unfolds. Now, of course, we talk about physical injuries, and we've used some examples there quite loosely, but we know that in a modern workplace, there are also other types of injuries that the law recognises as being compensable just as, just as much. And they might arise out of, they might be um, psychiatric injuries that are secondary to a physical injury in terms of adjusting to pain and disability or, and, or other factors. Or there could be what we call pure psychiatric injuries. And you will have heard these sorts of context, concepts, um, bullying, harassment, overwork. So uh, pure psychiatric injury claims. Um, now, they do present some challenges uh, in terms of their investigation because of the dynamics associated with the injury. But also, sometimes and often, the dynamics associated with how the injury is alleged to have occurred. So some of the investigation methods that you might use with respect to a pure psychiatric injury may just need to be uh, tweaked so as to ensure that that information gathering process is as effective as it could be in getting to the truth of what occurred and the veracity of the allegations that have been made. Some of the strategies that I share with employers when inv investigating in that space for that injury is to be patient and to be kind. Explain to the injured worker and to those people that might be involved exactly what the process is. Generally speaking, there's no need to rush the so sorts of matters that need to be investigated in, a, in circumstances like that. Be open and encouraging with concepts and dynamics like support people being available. But of course, you want to be sufficiently forensic about it such that you know, it may not be a good idea that the person that is alleged to have perhaps done something wrong um, for that person to be encouraged as a support person. There's some you know, realities around that that you'd be sensitive to. But to be alert to concepts of support people, the timing of interviews, that, that, uh, how long they go for and when can all be very important in terms of exploring the issues that might be relevant to these sorts of matters. And again, critically, giving that opportunity for worker and witness interaction with that, in, in, with that investigation process, inviting sign-off and buy-in with respect to the version and the investigation that's being undertaken with respect to whatever it is that needs to be explored. Be patient and be kind. Generally speaking with investigations, what I share with people is to think umbrellas. If you're like me, I don't normally think I need an umbrella unless it's raining. Collecting documentation, preserving documentation, taking photographs, having in place sophisticated, responsive, investigative uh, uh, tools like your incident reporting system are all generally of most significance when you need them. And when you need them is often when there is a disputed claim at the statutory level or perhaps when you are facing or responding to a common law claim for damages. So if you can encourage those people that are responsible for investigations and responding to, work, to workplace injuries as part of your overall approach and culture to workplace health and safety, think umbrellas because that information that you can access, gather and preserve, perhaps not needing to call upon it for three years time, can be really important uh, when you are in that forum where this evidence is going to be explored and dissected in a completely different setting by people who may not be all that familiar with the dynamics of your work systems and all the challenges that you face, the more information that you have available to you, closely connected to a contemporaneous point near that time of the event, 
incident and injury can be really important in the court getting the best evidence available to it in terms of assessing what occurred. What's critical to all of this is that the law says that this test in determining whether or not an employer has breached their duty of care, it's not retrospective. The court must go back to the time of the incident and look forward in terms of what the risk of injury is at the time that the person has suffered their injury and assess then what your response was at the time of injury. The court says it's impermissible by the time the matter comes to a trial to work backwards and to hypothetically uh, deconstruct uh, what should have occurred uh, in that way. It's impermissible. So that's why the, the uh, ability to create and preserve some of the documentation that we've talked about in the ways and the forms that we've talked about can be really important. Thank you very much.